All right, welcome everybody. My name is Andrea. I work in the canonical kernel team, mostly focusing on cloud kernels and kernel space in general. In this talk, I want to show you something I'm working on recently called opportunistic memory reclaim. And I'm going to show you how we can use this feature to improve hibernation performance. First of all, a quick introduction about hibernation. So what is hibernation? Hibernation is a feature that allows you to power down your system and restore it to its previous state when the system is powered back on. This is actually a quite old feature provided by the Linux kernel. In fact, it was originally designed as a feature for laptops and it used to be a really hot topic back in around 2004 when we didn't have the modern suspend RAM technologies that we have nowadays. And at that time, the idea was to implement a mechanism in the kernel that would allow to dump the entire content of your memory to a persistent storage so that you could power up your system, save your battery, and when the system was powered back on, the memory could be restored, reading the data from the persistent storage. And in this way, you could resume all your running applications, all your active sessions, and so on. Now, like I was saying, this is quite an old feature, but is it still relevant to talk about hibernation nowadays? Well, interestingly enough, there are still some modern use cases about hibernation, and one of them is cloud computing. In fact, in uh, late 2018, Amazon announced the support for hibernating EC2 instances in their cloud. Question is why? Why a cloud provider would want to invest development time and efforts to provide such feature? And it's interesting to notice that there are some useful use cases for this, for this particular feature. One of them is to give the ability to pose your workload nicely when your budget is over. For example, in the Amazon infrastructure, the Amazon cloud, you can create instances that are called spot instances. And you can see them as low priority instances that run on temporarily unused resources. They are cheap, but if a high priority instance comes in and reclaim the resources they paid for, we need to find a way to migrate the low priority instances somewhere else. However, if uh, you can't find enough resources to migrate, the only alternative is to stop these instances. And in this case, hibernation can provide a pretty nice way to stop these instances way better than simply shutting them down. Another use case is to give the ability to deploy worm instances. So basically you can deploy an instant, install all the required packages, start all the services that you want. And at that time, instead of adding the instances immediately to production, you can hibernate the instance and keep it in a frozen state. And when it's really needed, we can just resume from hibernation and immediately add to production. And this works because usually resuming from hibernation can be faster than a cold boot. Now, in all these examples, hibernation can be a winning solution, but performance is important. In fact, hibernation is a winning solution only if uh, hibernation is fast in the previous case, and if resume is fast in the second case. Especially in the first case, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, uh, it's actually a regular scheduling problem where we have like low priority tasks that are interrupted uh, by higher priority tasks. That's the same problem. So in this scenario, hibernation is really the way to implement a context switch between a low priority instance and a high priority instance. And if this contest switch is not fast enough, uh, clearly this is not a winning solution. 
So how can we make hibernation faster? Well, first of all, let's try to understand how hibernation works. And I've tried to summarize everything in this diagram. So on the left, we can see the main memory and all the light blue boxes represent the chunks of allocated memory. When an hibernation event happens, the kernel needs to pack all these light blue boxes together and create what is called an hibernation image. Then the hibernation image is written to the swap device. And at this point, the system can be simply powered off. On resume, we are booting an instance of another kernel that is going to check if there's a valid hibernation signature in the swap device. If a valid hibernation signature is found, the kernel will copy all the hibernation image from the swap device back to memory and all the blocks will be resumed at the right locations. At that point, the kernel will perform a special jump operation that will jump into the previous instance of the kernel and the system will be resumed. Now, I want to highlight a couple of things in this, uh, in this diagram. One thing is that in order to generate the hibernation image, the kernel needs to allocate memory. And if there's not enough memory, we can either abort hibernation and resume the normal execution, or we can try to free up some allocated memory. Obviously, it's really easy to free memory that already has a copy in the corresponding backing store. For instance, uh, clean page cache pages. This is memory that can be proclaimed immediately without triggering any additional I.O. Or we can decide, for example, to swap off some uh, uh, allocated anonymous memory or to flush uh, some dirty page cache pages. But in the last two cases, um, in order to free up some memory, we need to do I.O. So yes, we can definitely drop memory, uh, but this will cause more I.O. Another thing that I want to highlight is the fact that uh, on the right side, we don't have all the light blue boxes that we have on the left side. And this is to highlight the fact that not all the memory needs to be saved into a hibernation image. So on resume, probably some caches will not be present or some memory won't be present because it's been swapped out. Now that we understand more how hibernation works, we can see what we can do to speed up performance. And first of all, let's try to identify the main bottleneck of hibernation. Usually the main bottleneck is represented by the IO that is required to write the hibernation image to, to the swap uh, device. And on resume, the bottleneck would be to, uh, the again, the IO required to load the hibernation image from swap device back to memory. So if we are able to reduce this IO, we can probably achieve a faster hibernation resume. Now, how can we reduce the IO? Well, one way is using compression. So the hibernation image can be reduced by compressing it. In this way, we will probably do less IO, so hibernation will be faster. Another way, like I was mentioning, is to drop some memory, again, to, in order to reduce the size of the hibernation image. And we can drop some clean page cache pages, for example, we can just drop some caches uh, that doesn't require additional I.O. And this would reduce the hibernation image and would speed up hibernation time. But if we need to drop some uh, anonymous memory, for example, or to flash some dirty page cache pages, in this case, we are still generating I.O. So this is not actually improving hibernation performance because yes, the hibernation image will be smaller, but in order to have a smaller hibernation image, we still need to do I.O. So here comes the idea of opportunistic memory reclaim. 
the generic idea is to provide to the user space an interface that allows to trigger a memory reclaim in the kernel. So we can use this interface to trigger memory reclaim in advance and prepare the system to be more responsive when needed. In the particular hibernation scenario, we can use opportunistic memory reclaim to drop or reclaim memory in advance. For example, using some idle cycles in the system, like if the system is idle or mostly idle, we can opportunistically trigger a memory reclaim. So we can prepare the system to be hibernated. And if an hibernation event happens, most of the memory has been already swapped out or flushed or reclaimed. So hibernation will probably be faster. And that is the, uh, the idea, the particular usage of opportunistic memory reclaim that I have experimented. And how does it work? So this is how I implemented it. There's a small Python script uh, that is periodically checking the idle percentage of the CPUs in the system. If the idle percentage is greater than a certain threshold for a certain amount of time, it will trigger the opportunistic memory reclaim via this memory swap reclaim interface. That is obviously a specific kernel patch and um, yeah, the kernel will start to reclaim memory during using idle uh, cycles in the system. So that's the mechanism, detect when the system is mostly idle for a certain amount of time, trigger uh, artificial memory pressure so that the system will start to reclaim memory. And at that point, if hibernation happens, most of the memory is already saved to swap and we can hibernate faster. The interface that I've been using is the C group memory controller. Actually, the first patch that I posted to the kernel mailing list, uh, in the first patch I was uh, using a file under uh, CSFS and Sys power because yeah, that was a very hibernation specific uh, interface. And that's because I typically used uh, uh, the opportunistic memory reclaim for hibernation. But then I realized this feature can be more generic and there can be benefits for other scenarios. So this is why uh, in the next versions, I, I moved uh, to an interface implemented in the C group memory controller. And um, so the main reason to use C group memory controller is to be able to apply a fine grained uh, memory reclaim policy. For example, we can create multiple C groups. This is just an example where I create uh, two C groups. One is called foreground, the other is called background. And the idea is to move the latency sensitive applications into the foreground C group and the latency insensitive applications into the background C group. And then when I want to trigger memory reclaim, I can reclaim memory only from the uh, background C groups. So in this way, I won't affect performance of the foreground C group. This can be useful, for example, in a context, uh, in a mobile device, for example, let's say you're playing a video game in a smartphone you may want to move the task of the video game in the foreground C group and keep all the other tasks in the background C groups, like the task that is periodically checking for my emails or the task that is uh, periodically checking if I have new messages on Facebook or something like that. And if you want to use opportunistic memory reclaim in this context, uh, you may start the uh, task list for reclaiming memory only from the background C groups. So your video game won't be affected. The performance of your video game won't be affected and you won't notice any additional latency. This is the test case that, I, uh, that I've been using to show the benefits of the opportunistic memory reclaim. So I created a VM with 
eight gigabytes of RAM and eight gigabytes of swap file. And I explicitly set at this speed maximum IO bandwidth of 100 megabytes per second because I wanted to show the benefits of this solution if we don't have a super fast storage. In fact, this is actually simulating pretty well what we usually have in a cloud environment. In fact, multiple VMs are running in a, usually in a shared environment on the same hypervisor and they share also the IO bandwidth or in some cases there are explicit IO limits. So this is to simulate this scenario. And the test that I've been using is this one. I, I allocate 85% of memory. I wait for 60 seconds, almost in idle. And then I trigger an hibernation and I resume measuring the time. So this test case is probably simulating pretty well what usually happens on a, one of those spot instances that I mentioned earlier. Uh, because spot instances usually are deployed. They start a bunch of services that could be like a large JVM application or a web server or any other services that are uh, allocating a bunch of memory. Then they serve a bunch of requests, uh, but after that, they usually sit in an idle condition. And we can use this idle state to reclaim some memory. So when we need to hibernate these instances, hibernation can be faster. And so is it really working? Let's see, here are some results. Uh, uh, in this column, we can see the results using a 5.9 uh, mainline kernel. And, and I repeated the test. So this is an average, uh, an average time over 10 runs. Um, this is the 5.9 mainline kernel. And this is the 5.9 mainline kernel with the opportunistic memory reclaim patch. And the, uh, the, the small user space script that is running the one that is monitoring for the CPU idle percentage and that is triggering memory reclaim. And I did the test uh, with the using image size default or image size zero. And as we can see, the results are really promising. Like in the image size default case, uh, the mainline kernel took almost 50 seconds to hibernate. And with the opportunistic memory reclaim in place, it took only 3.4 seconds. So that uh, hibernation in this case is more than 10 times faster. And also the resume case is faster, is like more than two times faster. And that's because in the opportunistic memory reclaim case, uh, the hibernation image is way smaller. And that's because the memory has been already reclaimed or swapped off or flushed in advance. I repeated the tests also with uh, image size zero. Um, basically, image size is a, a CSFS tunable in CIS power uh, that where you can specify how aggressive the kernel should be at reclaiming memory when hibernation uh, needs to be done. And using a smaller value means that the we're asking the kernel to make the to try to make the hibernation image smaller. So zero means way, uh, make the hibernation image as small as possible. And in this case, we can see that we are paying the price of uh, trying to reduce the size of the hibernation image during hibernation. But then ultimately the kernel can really make a smaller hibernation image. And we can see the advantage on resume because the resume time with the image size zero is reduced respect to the image size default in the mainline kernel. And hibernation, hibernation time, however, is, uh, is bigger because it, with the image size default, uh, we needed 50 seconds to hibernate with image size zero, now we need uh, 70, 71 seconds. 
However, in the opportunistic memory reclaim cases, well, performance are pretty much the same in both cases. And that's because we, we have already optimized the size of the hibernation image using the spare idle cycles of the system before the hibernation event happens. So I've also prepared a live demo to show you better how opportunistic memory reclaim works. All right, so let's switch to a consult session here. All right, here we can see a virtual machine that is running. Uh, it's running a Ubuntu Groovy distribution. And the kernel that I'm using is a 5.9 kernel with the opportunistic memory reclaim patch applied. Now, in the first example, I'm not going to use the opportunistic memory reclaim because we want to measure like the baseline of the hibernation performance. So first thing that I'm going to do is to activate swap using a swap file. And then I'm going to start a memory stress test allocator. We can see that initially I'm not using very much memory, only 150 megabytes are allocated. And this swap is not used at all, of course. Uh, there are eight gigabytes available and no swap is used. Now, I'm going to start a memory allocator that is allocating 85% of the available memory. And we can see up here that the memory is being allocated. When we reach 85% of the memory, um, in my usually in my test case, I, I was still waiting 60 seconds in idle to simulate the workload of a usual of a typical uh, spot instance. But in this time to speed up the demo a little bit, we can we can just hibernate because nothing is gonna happen in the system at this point. Uh, no one is triggering the opportunistic memory reclaim. So if I hibernate now, system needs to swap off almost uh, uh, 6.5 gigabytes of memory. And after that, the hibernation will complete. So now I'm triggering hibernation. And as we can see, uh, this task is stopped, meaning that the system is currently uh, unusable. And we need to wait that all this memory uh, is flushed to the swap device, then the system can be stopped. While we're waiting, I am going to describe what I'm gonna do next. The next step will be to activate the OMR CPUD, that is the user space component that is monitoring for the idle percentage uh, in the CPUs, and that is triggering the opportunistic memory thing. All right, so we can see here on the right side that hibernation almost completed. And so when we see the prompt here, it means that the system is fully hibernating. hibernated. And I can start the system again, and hopefully my sessions will be resumed. We can see that now that's the resume time that is taking a little bit of time because again, it's loading the hibernation image from the swap device to memory. And soon we should be able to see the spinner going again, meaning that the system has been fully uh, resumed. And we should also see the memory appear being updated. Uh, let's see, all right, the spinner is spinning again, the memory is updated, so the system has been fully resumed. Now I'm going to repeat the same test. So just to make sure I'm starting with the same from the same conditions, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually um, reboot the system. All right, well, back into the system and up here, I'm going to start the my watch that is checking for the available memory. Down here, I'm going to prepare this time OMR CPUD. That is the user space component that is monitoring the idle state of the CPUs and that is triggering the memory reclaiming 
if the system is mostly in idle. And then I'm going to prepare my memory stress test. And down here, I'm gonna prepare my interactive session to trigger hibernation. Now, first thing, let's start the OMR CPUD. Um, and then I'm gonna start the memory allocator. As we can see, well, initially the system was fully idle at 100%. Now we can see that one core has an idle percentage of 0%. That is the memory stress test that is allocating all the memory, all the memory up to 85%. And as we can see up here, the memory is being allocated. The swap is currently not used because the memory reclaiming is not triggered. Now that the memory allocator is done and the system is mostly idle for a certain amount of time, uh, the memory reclaiming has been triggered and the so we are using the idle state of the system to swap, to pre-swap off some memory. So now if, uh, uh, if an hibernation event happens, I don't have to swap all off all the memory because most of the memory has been already swapped off and we can see that basically yes this task is running but there's just a spin there that uh, so it, it's just doing print and it's not very cpu intensive it's actually using a small amount of cpu uh, something else is coming into the system and it either it's either refaulting pages or it's starting to use CPUs, the, mem the triggered memory reclaim would just stop. So now we are approaching to reclaiming all the memory basically. So if an hibernation event happens now, uh, yeah, remember before we had to wait a lot of time to hibernate and now we have already prepared the system in advance using the idle cycles of the system itself. So if I hibernate now, we can probably count to three and hibernation will be done. Let's see. So one, two, three, done. You can see immediately the prompt right here. We have already hibernated and I can resume. And also the resume should be faster than before. As we can see, we have already loaded the hibernation image right here and soon we should see the uh, spinner spinning again exactly so another test that i uh, would like to show you is to something to highlight the advantage of using a uh, memory c group interface so what i'm gonna do is to yeah, let's preset the swap. To do that, I usually run a swap, for, swap off followed by another swap on. In this way, I'm basically cleaning up the swap, reinitializes the swap. And this time, uh, so I, like I was saying, this time I wanna show you the advantage of using a memory C group interface. So uh, still running my memory stress test, this time I'm also running a latency sensitive application. It's this time Delta is a simple application. It's a, again, a simple Python script that is um, showing a little spinner. And each time that it's doing the print, it's printing also the Delta time between, the, between one print and another. And since the, since the system is not doing anything special at the moment, uh, we can see that the latency is always uh, just perfect. It's always uh, 1000 milliseconds. Now, uh, I'm going to start the uh, OMR CPU demo that is using the file in the C group, in the memory C group root FS. So that means that memory reclaim is still happening system-wide. So when memory reclaim is triggered, I'm going to reclaim memory from everyone in the system. 
the latency sensitive task included. And as we can see, every time that we trigger memory reclaim, we see a little spike in the latency, like three milliseconds here. Let's see if another, all right, another memory reclaim happens, so another three milliseconds and so on. Now I can also start the memory stress test allocator again. When this guy is running, because it's also CPU intensive, uh, the memory reclaim won't be triggered. But as soon as we hit the target percentage that is 85%, uh, we will start to kick off some memory reclaiming and we will probably see other spikes in the, uh, in the latency sensitive task. Probably not uh, during the first uh, memory reclaim because there's a lot of memory allocated by the memory intensive application. Well, actually we have seen a four millisecond uh, uh, spike. This could be also done by the IO that is required to swap off the, uh, the memory. So now let's wait uh, as before for the whole memory to be swapped off so that we can see uh, if we are also hitting other spikes down here. And while we're waiting, I'm gonna tell you what I wanna do next. Uh, the next test would be to create two separate C groups and I'm gonna move the latency, um, sorry, the, I'm gonna move the memory allocator stress test into a C group and the latency sensitive uh, application into another C group. And I'm gonna call this one a background C group and this one a foreground C group. Oh, let's see, now we have hit the uh, pretty big latency spike, like 17 milliseconds. Oh, here's like, yeah, 271 milliseconds. So we are hitting significant uh, latency spikes down here doing memory reclaim. And that's because we are doing a system-wide memory reclaim. Now, let's try again. Uh, I'm gonna repeat the test, but this time, like I was saying, we uh, are going to create uh, two C groups. Uh, one called FG and the other is called BG. And I'm going to move uh, this guy here in the background C group, because this one is the session, is the shell session where the uh, memory stress test will run, the memory allocator will run. And this guy down here that is gonna be the uh, foreground task or the latency sensitive task that will be moved in, uh, in the foreground C group. Perfect, just to make sure I'm running everything in the correct C groups. Right, this one is running in BG and this one is running in FG. Fine. Now I'm going to restart the two different benchmarks. Memory stress test, uh, the uh, latency sensitive test, and I'm going to start OMR CPUD again, but this time I'm going to reclaim memory only from the background C group. So uh, what I should see uh, is that memory will still be reclaimed, uh, but this time I shouldn't see, theoretically I shouldn't see any extra latency here. So I won't affect performance at all from the uh, latency sensitive task. And because I'm, all right, memory reclaiming has been triggered because this, this time I will only reclaim memory from the background C group. So I won't affect performance of this guy that's running here. All right, memory is reclaimed. So far so good. I don't see any extra latency down here. And if you remember in the previous case, we, ha we, already, uh, we had already seen some, uh, some spikes down here. Let's wait till the end, since uh, 
when all the memory will be reclaimed. Uh, now we are, I think we are approaching to almost all the memory being reclaimed. But, but as we can see, this task doesn't notice any impact on performance. So if you recall the uh, example that I mentioned uh, almost at the beginning of the presentation, um, yeah, the fact that we have a, like a latency sensitive application that could be like a video game played on a, on a mobile phone, we can see that the performance are not affected at all. Uh, yeah, all right, we are reclaimed all the memory. We are triggering more memory reclaiming, but uh, yeah, performance are not affected. All right, so let's, let's go back to the slides. Conclusion. So opportunistic memory reclaim can definitely help to speed up hibernation resume time, as we have seen. But hibernation is not the only scenario where this feature can be helpful. Uh, being able to trigger memory reclaim uh, in advance from user space can provide benefits to the scenario like that we, we have seen in the last example. Like uh, if we want to improve system responsive during large allocation bars, for example, if we want to prepare the system to be able to handle large allocations, or if we want to prioritize responsiveness of uh, certain latency sensitive applications versus uh, latency insensitive applications. Or even if we want to reduce the overall memory footprint in a system, like there are cases where memory can be really expensive, and uh, being able to trigger uh, memory reclaiming from user space can help to reduce the memory footprint uh, when if it's needed. Now, future work. So the overall idea is still work in progress. In particular, we still need to figure out the ideal ABI that the kernel should provide to use the space to make this feature as generic as possible and so that it could benefit uh, many different contexts and, and not only uh, hibernation, of course. I know that uh, Google is working on a similar solution. They are experimenting a similar proactive memory reclaiming uh, technology uh, still based on memory C groups. And um, there's also uh, one important thing to mention and is the fact that even with the mainline kernel as it is right now, it would be possible to trigger um, an opportunistic memory reclaiming. Um, specifically, uh, there's a file in the memory C group FS in uh, C group V2 that is called memory.high and basically what you can do you can you can set a limit into this file that will represent the maximum threshold of allocated memory for a specific C group so theoretically setting a very small value into this file would force the kernel to reclaim memory however the downside of this approach is that we need to react faster and increase the limit soon enough or otherwise we may risk to trash the uh, entire C group or even worse the entire system if we don't respond fast at re-increasing the limit once the memory has been reclaimed. So the advantage in my opinion, uh, the advantage of the uh, single shot memory reclaiming is that there's really a uh, no way to badly affect or better to affect performance in a, in a too bad uh, like if uh, the system is starting to refold and and request memory that have been uh, memory that has been reclaimed basically it's just a one shot reclaim so system can refold and reload memory from swap or or in in the page cache from the corresponding files and 
we can decide from user space if we want to retry again to reclaim memory or if we just need to give up and based on certain uh, system statistics like the idle time that I was using or we can use either even use other statistics. So I also uh, added a few references here if you want to learn more about this topic. I guess the slides will be available somewhere. Uh, if not, you can reach out to me and ask for any information or questions. Uh, I think that's it. So thank you for listening. If you have any question, feel free to ask.